session is about composite classical and quantum channel discrimination by Bjarne Berg. So Bjarne, please, the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much. Hello? Uh, hello? Okay, cool. Um, maybe one more thing. I think this presenter isn't working. Um, I guess I have to do the slides here. That's also fine. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much for attending this talk on the last day. Um, I'll be talking about composite classical and quantum channel discrimination, and I'll be spending the first half of the talk roughly to try to you know, introduce and motivate a bit the problem, and then talk a bit about our results. So what I'd like to start with is kind of the simplest quantum hypothesis testing problem, where um, somebody gives you um, a state, let's call it omega, and your task is to decide between two possible options for what the state could be. It could either be state rho or state sigma, and the idea is that you have like a full, let's say, classical description of what rho and sigma is. Somebody writes on a density matrix of rho and sigma and tells you, okay, the state which you have as a physical state is supposed to figure out which of the two options it is. And, um, okay, how are you going to do that? The only real thing you can do is just do a measurement. And because you kind of want to discriminate between two possible options here, the thing you really want to do is some kind of binary PVM. That's like the most general thing you can do. And the way I'm going to set this up here is I'm going to you know, call one of the elements pi, and then the other one is going to be identity minus pi. And I'm going to say that if I measure pi, I'm going to claim that H0 is true. If I measure the other one, I'm going to claim that H1 is true. And um, in general, you're not going to be able to discriminate these two hypotheses perfectly, so you're going to make some errors. And we call these type 1 and type 2 error. Um, first one where you claim H1, even though H0 is correct, and then the type 2 error is the other way around. And um, you know, in this specific framework where we have a state and a measurement, you can kind of calculate these probabilities just by evaluating these traces. So the type 1 error is going to be the error that um, even though you actually have the state rho, you kind of measure the, the wrong P of M element, and then for the type 2 error, it's the other way around. Um, and you can kind of see that there is some, some kind of trade-off between these two errors. So you could do something fairly stupid and could, for example, just set one of these P of M elements to 0. Then you would never make a type 2 error, although you would sometimes make a type 1 error, or actually would always make a type 1 error if your state actually happens to be, to be rho. That's kind of a stupid thing to do, but it kind of illustrates that there's some trade-off to be had between these two errors. And um, so if you want to kind of optimize and find the best measurement, you have to, to some degree, say what, um, what you want to optimize for. And one thing you can do is you can, you can optimize for the sum of the type 1 and the type 2 error. You can think of this as choosing some uniform phi on the hypotheses. Then this is kind of the average error you expect. Um, or what you could do is you could say, actually, one of these errors I care about way more than the other one. So um, I really want this one, which in this case, I'm going to choose the type 2 error to be as small as possible. And the other one I'm happy with if it's just below some threshold of Cylon. That's what people call the asymmetric, the asymmetric setting on the asymmetric error. Um, this is what this talk is mostly going to be focused about, just because we have a lot more technical tools to study the asymmetric setting compared to the symmetric setting. Um, and something which you can do, and which is kind of nice from an analytical point of view, is to look at many copies and the many copy limit. So now the setting is that somebody gives you an n partite state, say omega n, and your task is to decide whether this omega n is either n copies of rho or n copies of sigma. And what you can look at then is the exponential decay rate of you know, this error, depending on which one you choose, um, in the number of states you have. So you look at this, this error, you take the logarithm, you divide by 1 over n, take a minus because your error should be less than 1. And um, you know, this is kind of defined the same way as previously, so these errors are basically just kind of the probability that you get your hypotheses wrong, um, optimized over all collective measurements. And you can take the limit n to infinity, and then here also epsilon to zero. And what this really means is, okay, you look at the, the asymptotic limit of the error decay rate, and this limit epsilon to zero just tells you you want to look at all these settings where your type 1 error also goes to zero in the asymptotic limit. So this limit epsilon to zero kind of filters out all possible ways you could choose measurements where your type 1 error stays below a certain threshold. So it stays above a certain threshold that doesn't go to zero. And it happens to be that, you know, these asymptotic quantities, even though they look very complicated, happen to have quite nice kind of simple to compute formulas. So this limit of the um, asymmetric error exponent happens to be the relative entropy. And then for the symmetric error exponent, you get what's called the Chernoff divergence, which you can calculate just kind of by evaluating these functions. And that's kind of very nice and maybe one of the big kind of cornerstones of quantum Shannon theory. And yeah, people have done this quite some time ago. Now you can say, okay, this is nice. Um, maybe we can kind of make this problem a bit more interesting, a bit more complicated, maybe also a bit more relevant. And the first thing I would like to do, kind of make this, you know, brief this up a bit, is to start talking about discriminating channels instead of states. So the setting is kind of similar, um, that you have two hypotheses, but now somebody gives you a black boxes of channel. 
So this is just kind of a thing that has a quantum input, and if you put something in, you get something quantum out. And um, the task is again to be discriminate between these two options, whether um, your channel is um, either E or F. And just for the pictures I want you to draw in a second, this black box is going to draw like this. So this is just kind of an illustration that this is kind of a thing which could either be E or F. And you know what you're going to do in practice now you have to kind of you know decide which input chase state you want to choose for your channel. And after that it kind of reduces to a state discrimination problem just because you have like an output state, which depends on you know what your channel is. Um, and you would think that maybe that's just kind of it. The problem is just really just the same thing as state discrimination with an optimization of input state. And that's maybe kind of true if you only have one channel. It gets a lot more interesting if you have many copies of the channel. Because now you can do different things. Um, the first thing you might think, oh, you know, the cool thing you can do here is you can use entanglement. Um, because if you have kind of all these copies of your channel, of your black box, um, you might want to think that you want to kind of pick a big entangled input state and feed into all of them. And that's something you can do. Um, and maybe something which you also want to do is that you want to have a part of the input state which you don't act on, which you call the reference or memory system. And then, you know, once you feed this into all of your channels, at the end you do a big measurement. And this was called a parallel strategy. Um, and it turns out you can do something even more general. You can do which was called an adaptive strategy, which is something like this, where um, kind of the idea is that in general you might think it would be beneficial if your input state to your black box kind of depends on the output of the previous black box because you have some information there. So kind of the setup then looks like this, where you start with some input state, um, and then part of it you feed into your first black box. The other part just kind of stays stays the same. And then you have some preparation map here, which kind of based on the output and what you stored decides the next input state for the next black box, and then you keep going until all the way to the end. And this was called an adaptive strategy, and um, it's fairly easy to see that every parallel strategy can write as an adaptive strategy, basically just by putting all these systems here into the memory part, and then these preparation maps just kind of swap the next input system up here and store the output, and then at the end what you end up with is the exact same thing as here. Um, so every parallel strategy is an adaptive strategy, but it's not the other way around. So this is more general and kind of the big question, maybe in quantum channel discrimination, also has gone online this talk, is to maybe find or you know, investigate to what degree these things are these adaptive strategies are actually asymptotically necessary. So to what degree sometimes maybe it's it's also optimal to just do some of this simpler thing here, where you don't have to kind of worry about all these preparation maps and optimize all of these things, you just have to kind of find one big input state. Um it turns out that if you uh, classically um the problem actually isn't that much more complicated than um, the state discrimination problem, just because it turns out that asymptotically adaptivity never helps. So you never need that. And um, also, for these kind of parallel strategies, the, the optimal thing is to just pick one specific input state and feed into every copy, and there's no kind of correlation. I guess entanglement you don't have in, in the classical setting anyway. Um, so classically, this is kind of simple, and the rate you get at the end is really just the same thing as for the state case, which is optimization of input states. Um, so classically, this is somewhat simple, um, but quantumly, it's not. So people have shown, first of all, that in this parallel case, entangled input states are needed in general for the optimal rate. And um, that adaptivity sometimes helps. So if you look at the asymmetric error, somehow adaptivity does not help. It's kind of been a big result. Um, that you can show that this um, optimal asymptotic error decay rate um, is given by this regularized rate of entropy, which happens to be also the optimal asymptotic error decay rate for parallel strategies. Um, and this is what this thing is kind of you take the rate of entropy between n copies of the channel optimized over all n part at input states, and you take the limit n to infinity where you divide by 1 over n. And this kind of encodes the fact that um, entangled states help. Um, but yeah, surprisingly, this also happens to be optimal for adaptive strategies, so you can kind of, adaptivity doesn't help you asymptotically, but it's only true in the asymmetric setting. If you look at symmetric errors, then um, we have examples to show that adaptivity helps. We don't have any asymptotic expressions for the rate because there are some technical issues there, which so far nobody's been able to solve. Um, so yeah, this problem is kind of a lot more interesting quantumly. And um, yeah, that was my section on using channels instead of states. And now kind of the, the next part, which you could make this problem more interesting, maybe also more relevant, is to is use composite hypotheses. What do I mean by composite hypotheses? Um, previously, um, given an unknown channel, we said that it either was going to be a channel E or a channel F. And um, now you want to generalize this to the case where your hypotheses just say that your channel comes from a set of channels. Um, there's obviously a strict generalization because your set could just contain one element, but it also kind of you know, makes the problem a lot more not general. But you don't really have to specifically know what you're going to get. Just say, okay, you know, 
it either comes from one set or from another set. And also, the decision problem you have to make, you don't have to specifically know what the channel actually is. You just have to decide whether it comes from this set or from the other set. Um, and what's just different about this problem now is um, also that you know these hypotheses don't exactly specify what you actually are going to get. So if you think about type 1 and type 2 errors, you kind of have to be a bit more specific what exactly we mean by this. Um, so the way I want to define errors is by kind of looking at the worst case. So I want to say the type 1 error is um, the worst case of all channels I could get from S that I incorrectly um, claim that they come from, from T, so that I incorrectly choose the wrong hypotheses. Um, so if I you say fix an input set in a measurement, this is exactly this expression where I take the premium over all um, channels E from S, and the same for the type 2 error. Yeah, kind of the, the idea is that you really need to find a setup, so an input set in a measurement that works for the entirety of the set compared to just kind of this individual pair we had previously. You know, so this problem gets a lot more interesting in the many copy case because um, now each individual channel you get doesn't necessarily have to be the exact same one. Kind of, you know, you could think of this problem in a way which still makes sense in this kind of a composite problem where you just kind of get a different channel from the set every time. And so the way I want to specify this problem and kind of, you know, the, in the generality in which I want to tackle it is this. So the hypotheses are specified by, by sets Sn and Tn, which I want to be subsets of these tensor product sets. So this uh, S tensor N, you just kind of every possible way which I could build a tensor product of N channels out of channels from S. And um, these Sn then, though, I can still specify. They don't have to be S tensor N, they could be, in which case I look at kind of the hypothesis testing problem where I get a different channel from S every single time. But you could also say something where kind of you want to look at the problem where you get the same one every time. In this case, you would choose the SNs like that. This is kind of a very, very general setup to study this composite problem with a many copy setting. And this is kind of the, the setup we want to consider and where we want to prove some results for. Um, so before we get to the maybe slightly more technical section, let me briefly say what we actually do need to assume about these SNs because we need to assume some things. Um, first of all, we want them to be closed under permutations of the N channels. So whenever I have like a channel here, which is kind of, you know, N individual channels, if I permute them, I still want them to be an element of SN. Um, secondly, if I remove one of the N channels, I want to get an element of SN minus one, kind of makes sense. Um, I want them to be topologically closed. That's not really necessary, but it makes the formulas a bit simpler. And um, I kind of want to make sure that my sets don't become too small asymptotically. So kind of it still stays a composite problem. Um, and for that, the assumption I'm going to make here is not really kind of, you can get away with less, but for this talk is what I want to assume, um, is that, for any channel in my base set, kind of, you know, the, the sets of things I want to discriminate between, I want the n tensor product to be in every SN. And maybe one thing to think about um, is that, you know, previously I defined these channels really as just kind of being, uh, sorry, these sets as just containing tensor products. But if you think that's still restrictive, one thing you can do is you can say, actually, the problem between discriminating these SNs and the convex hull of them is actually the same thing. That kind of follows from the fact that the ty these type 1 and type 2 errors are linear functions, and um, optimizing linear functions over convex hulls is the same as just optimizing them over the original set. So in that sense, you can even kind of get a bit more general by, by considering convex hulls if you want to. Um, before I talk about the results, maybe one more uh, kind of slide about why this problem is relevant. Um, well, testing and verification of channels is like a very, very common problem. Um, if you want to think about kind of a very, very random example, let's say you have a glass fiber and you want to know whether it's faulty. So, you know, a glass fiber is a spawn channel, you put a photon in, you get a photon out. And let's say you have some model about how it should behave. If it's not faulty, you're probably still going to have some noise. Um, and then you have some idea about how it might look like if it was faulty, depending on what the exact fault is. Um, and then if you have kind of one of, well, more than one possible way in which it could fail, then this is a composite problem. And this is exactly kind of what we're considering here. And kind of the, the reason why I want to emphasize composite hypothesis testing here is that just simple hypotheses in general I don't think are very realistic. It almost never happens in fact that you know, okay, I either give exactly that or exactly that. You always have at least some uncertainty in, the, in your specification. Um, so now starting to come to, to our results, like what we like to do, we would like to find some asymptotic expressions for the error decay rate for this channel discrimination problem. And maybe the first thing to start with is to look at the parallel case. So we have a setup like this. We have our, our n channels, which come from our set. And um, we're going to choose a big input state, which has a reference system, which we don't act on. And um, then we have a big measurement at the end. And um, we're able to prove for this for setting is the following. So um, given these assumptions on SN and TN that I just slide out, then the best achievable asymmetric error exponent, and from now on, we're just going to talk about asymmetric error exponents just because we don't have the tools to tackle the symmetric setting, um, with a parallel strategy is given by, by this thing. 
So maybe one more time, kind of what, what was the expression on the left-hand side? We look at this asymmetric error, so the best possible type 2 error, given that the type 1 error sets an epsilon, optimized over all parallel strategies, so all input states and all measurements. And then I look at the logarithm and divide by 1 over n, so I look at the exponential decay rate. I take the limit n to infinity, so I look at the asymptotic uh, limit, and uh, I take the, take the limit epsilon to 0 to kind of only look at the limits where also the type 1 error goes to 0. And this happens to, equal, to be equal to this expression, which involves relative entropy. That's nice. That's usually what we want. Um, so what does it look like? We have to maximize it over all entangled input states over n copies. And there's a reference system here, which I suppress in this notation. This should really be identity on n tensor en. Um, so I maximize over all, all input states, and I minimize over all elements from my sets, kind of all pairwise elements from my sets. But crucially, I don't have to look at elements from the set S n or T n, but from the convex hull. And one way to think about it is that kind of um, there's kind of two reasons why this expression isn't like a single letter formula where you have a circularization. One is that you need entangled input states, and kind of the only way you know to encode this is take this limit where you take bigger and bigger input states. And the other one is that you know that quantumly this composite problem actually has to be strictly harder than the kind of the worst case ID problem. This can't just be the minimum of all pairs of channels. And kind of the way the reason why it's harder and how this shows up in this formula is because you have these convex hulls here. So you take the minimum of a bigger set and that kind of encodes the fact that you really have to discriminate between sets and not between individual pairs. Um, Maybe some additional highlights about this formula, which set it off a bit from what people have previously done. So nobody actually looked at this channel case, but previously look, people looked at similar things for states. Um, what I would like to highlight here is that it's really is fairly general. We have very, very few assumptions on S and TN. So specifically, we don't need kind of the, uh, the S, which you know is the S1 and the T and the T1, to be convex. You can take essentially any set, so we don't even also have cardinality assumptions or something. don't need to be finite. Um, and also, we're considering a setting which doesn't have to be ID. So remember, these ENs and FNs, they don't have to be the same channel every time. They could vary within the set. Um, but we do need independence, which really means that like, we have tensor products of channels. We can't have like a big n-partite channel. Um, but other than that, like we are really, really general here. I think that's kind of one of the nice features about this formula. Um, maybe very, very briefly how you, 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 you prove this. I unfortunately don't have time to really go through the proof. Um, but the one of the key ingredients is kind of this minimax formula here, where you show that um, the infimum over channels from convex sets commutes with the supremum over input states. If you have a reference system, the reference system is kind of key. And uh, this looks almost like kind of a science minimax theorem, and it almost is, but kind of the problem here is that your relative entropy in general is not concave in the state. So you have to do some additional tricks. That's kind of a very neat, elegant argument that shows that because of some kind of orthogonal structure you have in the, linear, in the relative entropy, this minimax theorem survives, and you can exchange here. And this is kind of the key ingredient which we use to prove this. And the intuition here is that if you have kind of an infimum over convex sets of channels, then you can really get away with picking the supremum for the worst case, the, the, sorry, the supremum of the input state for the worst case channel pairing, and then this will work also for all, for all channels. That's kind of the, the interpretation. So that's what we can say about parallel strategies. Um, what can we say about adaptive strategies? So one thing that's fairly easy to see is that the composite error exponent kind of also always should be upper bounded by the worst case. Um, pairwise simple error exponents. So if I just kind of take any two elements from my sets and look at how hard it is to discriminate them, that should always be easier than then to discriminate the whole sets themselves. And this gives you this inequality, um, which is kind of a, a nice upper bound, but we kind of know it's not tight, and we also don't really know how it compares to um, the thing we previously had in the parallel case. So originally we thought maybe that um, here we can use some cool tricks, but we you know about relative entropies, we show that adaptive and parallel are equal, but it turns out they're not. So in the composite setting, adaptivity helps in general, even classically, and it's very nicely illustrated, I think, by this kind of cute example, which is a classical example. So um, we have we have four channels, E, A, B, F, A, B, which take one classical input bit to two classical output bits, and they work like this. Um, so essentially, E, A, and E, B are both maximally mixing. Whatever you put in, you get a, a mixture of two output states for probability one-half, but which two states you get exactly is, um, is different. So here the first output bit is A, and here the first output bit is B. And um, the idea with F is that um, for one of the inputs, you get kind of the same, it's the same mixture, but for the other one, like it prioritizes one of the two input states. Um, and then again, if A has A is the first output bit and if B is B is the first output bit. And your problem then you set up like this. So um, you set S and T, which contain these two channels, and I want to look at the setting where I get the same channel every single time. So kind of my composite problem looks like that, but I don't know which channel I'm going to get from the set, but you know, in every single copy I get from it is going to be the same. And the idea here then is that um, 
if you want to discriminate EA against FA, then one input bit is kind of useless. If I put in, uh, sorry, one input set is useless. If I put in B, they look exactly the same. But if I put in A, they, they, there's a difference, and I'd probably be able to discriminate them. Um, and the key point is that you know this optimal state between EA and FA is the different from the one from FB and EB. So to kind of pick the optimal input state, I kind of would want to know what kind of the index of my channel is, whether I have an A channel or a B channel. And the key thing that is I can kind of know that by just looking at the output once, because of the first output bit exactly tells me whether I have an A channel or a B channel. So adaptively, um, I can just kind of use the first channel in any way I want, and then I observe the first output bit, and then I know for sure whether I have an A channel or a B channel, and then I know what the optimal input state is. And then if I just kind of choose this input state from then on, and you know do a big measurement at the end, then the optimal weight I'll be able to get is exactly this one, where I have the maximum inside of the minimum, so I can really kind of tailor the input state to, to, the, to the pair I get. And um, that's nice. But now if you think about what you can do with a parallel strategy, with a parallel strategy you have to fix the input state before you can see any of the outputs. So, I mean, this is classical. You really can only pick your input state A or input state B. Um, and whatever choice you make, like um, if you happen to get the other channel, you're going to get it wrong. So the, the best thing you can do is to just pick A and B kind of in, like in alternatively. So you know, if you have N channels, then half of the inputs you pick as A, half the inputs you pick as B. And then whatever channel you actually end up getting, half the time you made the wrong choice. So half of your channel inputs are useless, and half of your channel uses are useless. So you're going to get half the asymptotic rate per channel use. Um, so that's kind of exactly how we show that um, classically the best parallel rate is given by half the adaptive rate in this example. So there's like a gap of factor two between adaptive and parallel strategies. Um, and maybe one, one final thing. Um, if everything is classically, we can prove that this only happens if the sets of channels are not convex. Um, otherwise, we can prove this formula for the asympt um, asymptotic exponent. Um, and we unfortunately can't prove this quantumly, and we also don't expect to be able to prove this quantumly. So we expect that quantumly there should be a gap between adaptive and parallel strategies, even if the sets are convex. But it's kind of hard to really find an example that works because you really have to calculate this expression. And in general, it involves some kind of regularized limit. It's very hard to bound this in a way that really shows this gap. But the intuition is that kind of this convexity should be enough only classically. Quantumly, there should always be a gap. I'm already a bit over time, so I'll skip over kind of the final conclusion. But thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is linked to the paper. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes, for the very nice talk. So we have maybe a couple of minutes, only two minutes for short questions. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a bit of a naive question, maybe, which is uh, why does your result not prove the generalized Stein's lemma? Because that's also for with composite hypotheses, right? Yes. Uh, so the issue is exactly that we need this tensor product structure. So what you get is exactly this kind of um, weakened form where you have kind of separability between each system, but not just between A and B. Um, because like if, if somehow we... Wait, where do I have this? Uh, so if we would get this without requiring these SNs to just be tensor products of channels, then we prove the generalized state Stein's lemma. But because of in this setting, um, you always still need your, your elements of your alternative set to be tensor products. And that's, that, that's not what you want for this, um, for this point of planar result. But yeah, it is kind of like, it is related to that, to that. And the thing we prove in the end is kind of exactly the same thing they proved in this paper where they, they talked about the kind of, you know, all the issues and the way to correct it where you have these kind of additional structure in the separate states that they're all separate between each individual system. Yeah. Is there any more questions? So maybe I just ask a very short question. So when you are distinguishing two s sets of quantum channels, you consider a worst case scenario error. Yeah. So I was wondering what happens, how, how difficult the problem gets if you consider something like averaging. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess the techniques we use don't really work in that case. They're kind of tailored to, like, we really use quite heavily these minimax techniques, and they're the key point is they have a maximum. Um, so that is really kind of worst case specific. You can get something if you just kind of do average case and, you know, keep the integrals all the way through. It's not very nice, though, and probably not very useful. Um, yeah, I don't really know. It's like, it's, it's a different problem, and like, I think half the stuff we do here just doesn't, doesn't quite work in that setting anymore. So uh, I want to say it's, it's probably quite hard. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. If there's not any more questions, let's uh, thanks Bjarne again. <laughs>